Welcome to this recording of Stories on Stage Sacramento's 2021 Opening Night. We're so proud to partner here with 916 Inc., a beloved creative writing nonprofit for area youth, and the B Street Theater, a regional theater treasure which has always centered their work on children's stories. Please enjoy this evening of stories by young authors performed by young actors. And with that, we'll move into why we're here, which is to hear wonderful stories by um, youth writers uh, performed by young actors. And first, I'll call on Autumn Peterson, who is uh, one of our authors, just to say a few words. Um, hi, I'm Autumn Peterson. I'm 14, and my story is called Of Beads and Blades. And it's basically a little short story about Tommy retrospecting about himself and his best friend. It's a wonderful story. <laughs> it's great to see you, Autumn. Uh, our next author is uh, Zoe. Zoe, would you like to say a few words? Hello there, I'm Zoe D and I'm in eighth grade. My story is basically about a person who is looking for something and they feel that once they find it, it will make everything better. And the title of the story is The Search for Something More. Excellent, great description. Uh, next we have Adora Hansen. Hi, uh, I'm Adora Hansen, I'm a junior and my story is uh, Unknown. Unknown was heavily inspired by my love for psychological thrillers as well as horror. Um, so that heavily inspired the story and the suspense that's in it. Uh, thank you. And next we have uh, Ash Bridges. Is Ash here? I'm not sure. Hello. Oh, there oh, there you, you are. Nice. There you are. Okay. <laughs> I'm, Ash. I'm in ninth grade and the story was inspired by um, wanting to experiment with, uh, with I don't know the word, but it's, <laughs> oh my God, I don't know the word. Well, it's certainly a suspenseful story. Yeah, I wrote Hanging Around and it was a group story with me and my family. That's yeah, a good one. And lastly, we have Dean uh, Balila. Hope I said that right, Dean. Hi, I'm Dean. I wrote, or I'm a senior in high school, and I wrote the moon, the moon is beautiful. And it's about two people who are apprehensive about their feelings for each other. Mm. And all of these stories are amazing. You're going to be blown away. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica to introduce our actors. Great, yeah, it's my pleasure. We have two actors who will be doing um, all of the stories tonight, so not a not a small <laughs> workload. Um, the first performer, I'll just have each of them introduce themselves. Um, the first is Truman Duran. So Truman, if you wanna say hey and tell us, I think it's how long you've been acting and then one of your favorite roles you've ever done. <laughs> uh, well, hi, I'm Truman. I've been, um, I'm in ninth grade. I've been doing um, acting at the B Street Theater summer camps for about five years. Um, when it, when it started out, it was just something fun to do in the summer, but, um, as it, as it went on, it was something that I really like enjoyed doing and something that I wanted to continue doing later. Excellent. Well, we're very glad to have you. Um, and he is joined by Caroline Elliott and Caroline, would you like to say same thing? Sort of how long you've been acting and why you, why you love it? <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, I'm Caroline. Um, I'm a sophomore in high school and I've been acting for about eight years uh, with um, and I'm with Bay Street Theatre and also Young Actors Stage um, and I think one of the reasons I love it is just because there's so much that goes into it with you know the script and then the interpretation of the script um, so I'm really excited for tonight. Wonderful well, we're glad to have both of you and Dorothy, do you want me to go into the sort of flow? Cool. So I'll sure. just be introducing each um, title and the piece author, and then I'll say which of the actors will be performing it, just so everybody's aware, because <laughs> we have a list and you don't. Um, so the first story will be Of Bees and Blades by Autumn Peterson, and it will be performed by Truman. Truman, whenever you're ready. Tommy, despite everything, found himself with a lot of time alone just him and his thoughts. 
thoughts that he despised. They were self-deprecating, self-loathing, questioning, paranoid, and bittersweet, just like, a, just like his personality. He violently shook his head, swinging his shorts sharply against a tree. Tommy took the blade out with a yank, taking a tree, chunk of the tree out with it. He only felt a little, a little churn of guilt in his stomach for that. He felt a laugh clouds way out of his throat after the thought. Guilty for hitting a tree? He was obviously spending too much time with Toby. Ah, Toby, the clingy, beloving idiot, Tommy called his best friend. Toby, the boy who looked so out of place holding a sword. The boy whose armor looked two, two sizes too big. Toby didn't belong in a war. He didn't deserve any of this. Tommy wondered why his friends even agreed to fight when it brought him nothing but nightmares and heartache. Why does he stand so tall like the world isn't against him? Stiff like this might be his last stand, and maybe it was. I want to do my part, Tommy, Toby replied honestly when he had asked. I know I'm not a fighter like you, but I want to help. And if helping means throwing myself to the end, to the end of the bow, I'll do it. Tommy hated how sincere he was being. See, Tommy was violent. He acted first and regretted later, saying things he didn't mean, lashing out with a sharp blade and sharper tongue. He jumped head first into the heat, uncaring if he came, if he came out bru burned and bruised. He fought and fought and fought. Toby wasn't like that. He tended to bees in the garden. He picked flowers in a field. He talked things out. He cried, he laughed. His hands were clues guarding, not the hill of a sword. His eyes were bright at night, untouched by the labors of war. He was at peace. He was, in, he was serene. He was Tommy's best friend. Alas, he knew Toby was a fighter in his own way, stand, standing his ground with nothing but a smile. And Tommy didn't deserve him, but he fought for that smile all the same. Thank you. Wonderful. Yay. Yes. Oh, that's good. A good idea, Jay. Snapping, since we're all muted. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, and if, um, I would say if the audience would like to unmute for a moment to uh, give our actor and uh, author a little applause and love, that would be fine. <laughs> They deserve it, huh? Wonderful oh, story, great. Autumn. Wonderful performance, Truman. Very fun. Wonderful. So then our next piece is The Search for Something More by Zoe D, and it will be performed by Caroline Elliott. Caroline, whenever you are ready. Part one. I looked for a long time. I remember just being a young child when I began my search. I vividly remember when my mother told me the story that made me search. I remember this day as if it was yesterday. Part two. One warm, cozy October day, my mother and I gathered close to our warm fireplace since I was shivering. My mother gathered me close in her lap. We had sat there together for a long time, holding our hands up to the warm fire, feeling and enjoying its warmth. Mama, I remember saying, tell me a story, please. I looked up at her with pleading eyes. My mother couldn't resist. She smiled down at me. All right, she said, get close. I did. I snuggled close and buried my face into her shoulder. She began. Once in a deep village, there lived a magical creature. It was called a mirin. It was said to hold answers and hold what each human was searching for. I stared at her with wide eyes. Really, I had asked. This is what the story says, she replied. And then she continued on. Some searched for the mirin, but no one known ever found it. But one day, a young girl set out in search of it. She traveled for 10 days. Once she thought she caught a glimpse of the mirin, but when she turned around, she couldn't see anything. Each day, she wandered further from the place she belonged. And the farther she traveled, the weaker she felt, the more hopeless she got. As far as it's known, the girl never found the mirin. She tried, but she didn't. She danced a while trying to find it, but she felt so hopeless, she quit. Mama, is this a true story? I asked, my eyes bright. No one really knows, my mother responded, but I don't think so. I mean, how could such a thing exist? Do you want me to continue? I nodded. She talked on. Next, an elderly man searched for the last days of his life. He searched for 10 years. He never sighted the mirror at all. He died of old age 10 years after he started searching. I looked up at her. Did anyone find the mirror? I asked. I couldn't keep my curiosity to myself anymore. You'll have to wait and find out, my mother teased. I listened on. Mama, I cuddled close in her lap as she finished. Why did so many people look for something that wasn't real? 
My mother turned to me, and I, I was surprised to see tears falling from her cheeks. Because they didn't know it wasn't real. My mother's voice wobbled. Who knows, but it could be real. I wasn't convinced. Ever since I was young, I was always told that things in stories were pretend. What? But I took this story to heart, and as I grew older, I remembered it. Part 3. The breeze blew past. Was I taking on something ridiculous? Was this meant to be? Was I shooting too far? Was I reaching for the impossible? I let go of being perfect, or being sad, or everything that I wouldn't need. I never knew, but I continued on. It was hard. My hair flew around before me, and sometimes I couldn't see. Sometimes I could barely hear. I heard nothing except the whirling, whistling wind. Sometimes I could barely feel myself from the cold. Sometimes I wanted to give up. But I didn't. I searched on for this magical being. The mirror was the thing I'd always longed for. I had to find it. I just had to. I journeyed on. Sometimes I felt blind. Sometimes I felt deaf. Like I was just walking straight into a world that couldn't be seen. I looked for a few years. I wandered on and on. One night, I felt very helpless. I lay under the stars, enjoying the beauty. However, I, I could not feel happy. I felt I wouldn't be whole until I found the mirror. I just wouldn't. I stared at the stars once more and then at the nearby lake. I glanced into it, hoping to see the mirror, but I didn't. Part 4. I grew older. Soon I was an adult. I searched. I looked everywhere for the mirror, everywhere, from the Sahara Desert to the glimmering forests to the beautiful oceans. At first, my mission was to be happy. At this point, I'd forgotten all about that. Now the mission I had was to find the mirror. The mirror was where the answers I wanted lay. If I found the mirror, I'd be happy. It all would lay with the mirror. Right? So I kept going. When I began the journey, I didn't know how difficult this would be. I knew the mirror must be a thing, but... The longer I waited, the more I grew unsure. Was I searching for absolutely nothing or something that never existed at all? I was doubtful. I closed my eyes and thought hard, and then I was taken away to somewhere else. Somewhere I had never been. I stared across this beautiful crystal clear water, and I stared again at the beautiful sight. It was a bird. It had the most beautiful feathers of gold and white. Its feathers shimmered beautifully in the moonlight. I turned to the bird. Hello? I asked, a bit unsure of who or what this bird was. I heard some words just appearing in my mind. It was strange, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. Hello. I heard a beautiful vo musical voice call out. I looked at the bird. Was the bird talking to me? Was I hallucinating? Who are you? I asked in shock. I heard words appearing in my mind again. You know who I am. You've been looking for me. You have found me. I stared into the bird's eyes. I gasped. The mirror? I stammered. It looked into my eyes, and I felt completely understood. All those years I spent feeling incomplete, feeling lonely, feeling empty, were gone. The bird nodded its large head. I am. I live not where anyone looks for me. I live in you. You've been looking for me. I live inside of everyone but I can only be found when you look inside. You have everything you've wanted inside all you long. You've been searching for yourself. You. Thank you. Oh. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, what an amazing Caroline. story, Zoe, and, and the performance, Caroline. Oh my goodness, that was great. Very magical. I love it. <laughs> um, next, we have Unknown, written by Adora Hansen. It will be performed by Truman again. So Truman, whenever you are ready. You get your toothbrush. Come on. I've arrived home. The sun is down, and there's a slight drizzle. As I approach my porch, I see a medium-sized box. I don't recall ordering anything, but I take it inside. It's a bit heavy, and as I, I, and I struggle to unlock the front door. If I done my keys and close the door, I head to the kitchen. I place the box on, on the dining room table. Inspecting the box, there are no labels or handwriting anywhere. I walk into the kitchen and grab a pair of scissors. Walking back to the package, I hear my phone ring. 
must be a text from my mom asking if I'm okay with my new job. I put the scissors on, on top of the box and headed towards my phone. Message from an unknown number, the phone says. I see, you, I see you got my package. You can open it with me. I suck in my breath. Who is this? What do they want? How do they know me? As these questions rack my, my panicked brain, I feel a hand grab me, pulling me back. I have little time to react as I feel a cloth over my face. It's dark and it's cold. I open my eyes. My knees are weak. In the corner of a room, under a light, I see the box. Crawling over to it, I see that the box has been opened. And all I see in the box is a note. Welcome home, my sweet flower. Thank you. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Oh, so creepy. I love it, Adora. <laughs> so creepy. <laughs> Very nice job, Truman. Thank you. Um, great. Well, that was it. So short, and yet I was going, wait, what's what, what next? <laughs> what's happening? Um, our next piece is going to be Hanging Around by Ash Bridges, and again, it will be performed by Truman. So we've got back to back. So Truman, take your time. Whenever you're ready, go ahead with. Well, I'm hanging off a cliff. Not sure if I'm going to make it. I haven't seen it in a while. Maybe I should explain how I got here. Okay, it all started with me wanting to go for a jog. See where, where I went wrong there? I wanted to be good in exercise. Ha, that was my first mistake. Anyway, I drove up here to this gorgeous trail of the beaten path. Mistake two, but now to fix those mistakes. You know, I'm not gonna be like the, one of those people from movies. I'm gonna stay still and I'm not gonna lose my grip. I could ask my phone to, to help help using the speaker option. It might not work though. After all, I'm on a cliff. Phone, I say. The phone responds. Yes. Call for help, I say. Calling 911, the phone says. 911, what's your emergency? The dispatcher responds. Uh, yeah, my name is Brad, and I'm currently hanging off the edge of a cliff. Okay, let me pin your luck. The phone cuts out. Seriously? Okay, I, I kind of expected that, if I'm being honest. I am in the middle of nowhere on a cliff. All right, let's see what I can do here. Um, back to what I was saying before about the phone disaster, I decided that today would be a good day to be healthy and get some exercise. See, but on the way here, I got a feeling that I probably should have stayed home. The universe was giving me signs. And, and I decided to say, nah, universe, I'm good. I can do this. So when I went to the car again, I had to turn the key and the ignition three times. I had three chances to get myself back inside. Did I? I did not. No, no, I won't let this stop me. I backed out of the driveway and almost got hit by someone flying down the street. I had to call my neurologist after that. I figured, hey, there's some cardio before my jog here. Then, yes, it continues. I know I should have listened. Okay. I was ready to make a left hand turn in my car, and then someone ran the stop sign and almost T boned me. Wow, more cardio, I thought. Okay, so now you have some idea about how my day is going. What do I do now? Gotta think. Phone? I ask, yes. Call for help. Calling 911. 911, what's your emergency? Ping my location. I'm hanging off a cliff. Hello? Uh, hello? Okay. It disconnected again. Really? Okay, well, I hope they heard me that time. I'll try again, but first let me finish my story. Right, where did I leave off? Right, right. Um, I was almost getting T-boned. Yet again, another sign that I decided to smartly, that I decided so smartly to listen to. Okay, don't judge. I want to be healthy. This is the last time I jog. You know, hopefully not because I die, but just because I'm never, never coming back to this damn cliff again. Okay, um, anyway, almost got T-boned, finally made my way here. When I arrived, there was a slight drizzle. The weather app did not let me know this. I stepped out of the car and my foot slipped. It was a little wet from the drizzle. No big deal, I thought. So I'm jogging, right? I'm enjoying the view, the air smells nice. After a little drizzle, I see a damn bear. A bear, what? Where do I live? Why are there bears? Okay, whatever. My smart idea is to jog where bears live. So I dash for cover and I slip again. As I tried to gain my balance, the pine needles acted like butter on the floor. My legs flew in the air and I was horizontal before I even knew what was going on. I tried to grab onto something, but I couldn't. Wait, is that a siren? Yes, I hear sirens. I wonder how far I went. 
mean, probably not that far, if we're being honest here. Okay, why aren't they moving a little quicker? What if the bear is still there? That would probably stall them, right? Wait, I think they're coming to me. I don't want to yell. Everyone that yells in movies ends up falling off a cliff because, you know, they're screaming, thrashing around like a toddler. I hear somebody's feet stomping towards me. I wonder how long I've been hanging here. My muscles aren't even aching yet, which I, I mentioned before, I'm in, I'm in need of some exercise. So this is surprising to me. It must be adrenaline. I've heard that ad adrenaline can make you super strong. I, I wonder if that's even true, or is it just something that they tell you? So, you know, just so if, you know, a car falls on your child or whatever, you have a chance to save them because of adrenaline. I don't know. Oh, they're getting closer. Hey, I yell, You're standing on my fingers. What the hell? I see him, he's down there. Is he alive? I don't know, doesn't look like it. But I died? I fell off a cliff and died. Because I wanted to get fit? All right, well, this is really the last time I go jogging. Why am I still hanging here? What, how do I get to move on? Could this guy get off my fingers at least? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> hey. Hey. It's great for voice, authorial voice. Oh my goodness, so cool. So funny, <laughs> funny yet terrifying, obviously. <laughs> Very well done, Ash, and very well performed, Truman. I, I hope you're never in that situation, but if you were, you're hilarious. <laughs> so um, our final piece tonight is called The Moon is Beautiful. It is by Dean Balila. Again, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and it is performed by Caroline. So Caroline, whenever you are ready. It was Thomas who really stepped up first. He had brought Kit out on some misty night, a picnic basket in one hand and Kit's hand in the other. They had set up their blanket near the edge of an overhang, a popular spot to look over the town and the rising light in the distance. Like the gentleman he was, Thomas had poured them non-alcoholic juice, and like the klutz he also happened to be, they needed a few napkins in the process. Kit took notice of his shaky hands, the way the juice sloshed in the bottle as he held it. Something was festering inside his stomach. It was never truly silent where they sat. The insects of the night made sure they knew they were there. In the distance, they could also few, hear a few howls. It was not like them at all to be silent, especially when the need to speak was almost bubbling out of them. Thomas spoke first, or, well, spoke would have been a very loose term. I really, really like the moon, he had almost yelled out frantically. The wine glass full of ap apple cider sloshed as he jerked to the side to look at him. Kit stared back at him with something akin to apprehension. I mean, I, I guess it's really pretty tonight. <laughs> Thomas could only swallow the lump in his throat and adjust his shirt collar. He was sure it was getting too tight. Yeah, yes, the moon looks beautiful tonight. <laughs> they look beautiful every night. That's uh, good. Silence once again engulfed them. I wish the moon knew how beautiful he, uh, they look. I wish the moon could be happy without feeling bad. I wish the moon could enjoy being the moon without having to change. Kit scratched one arm nervously. I don't get the joke. Thomas was perked up in an instant. He sat up straighter and held his gaze intensely. It's not a joke. I really do appreciate the moon. It, it almost hurts how much I adore it. it sounds... Awful? Kit whispered awkwardly. Words were drawing blanks in his mind. Thomas was acting strange. I don't think loving something should hurt. Okay, wait. Thomas backpedaled. It, it doesn't hurt. I mean, loving it doesn't hurt, I suppose. It's the... He paused for a few moments. It's, it's not being able to show it how much I do love it. Kit pursed his lips. That sounds really complicated. The gnawing in his stomach continued. I feel the same, though, he all but whispered out. It doesn't hurt, but it feels like I should be ashamed, like I should hide. To some people, I suppose it does hurt. He played with a frayed string that sat on the blanket. The moon is lucky to have people who love it, who can show it they care. Neither spoke for a moment again until Thomas clasped one hand over his wrangling one. 
I don't think we're talking about the same moon. Kit paused and then pointed up at the sky. What other moon is there? The other did not answer. Only holding his clammy hands tighter, Kit turned away from the soft light to ask him what was wrong. Thomas looked restless. It, it made him pause, the words getting caught in his throat. What other moon could there be? Kit asked almost voicelessly. Rather than answering, Thomas continued. Sometimes I think I don't deserve the moon. I don't deserve how bright it is. The moon is an out of it. You don't have a choice in the matter, Kit said with a soft smile. I know, which is part of the problem. The moon deserves someone who can be there, who can always make him smile. I wish I could be that someone. Kit brought a hand up. This time it was he who held Thomas as he trembled. I think he took a deep breath and willed his throat to work. The lump seemed to continue to grow. I think you're selling yourself a little short. I hate, I mean, the, the moon must hate it when you do that. Because they know how important you are in their life. If you weren't here, how could it be so bright tonight? Under the light, Kit's eyes shone with unshed tears. And stop talking about deserving. The moon isn't someone greater than you, Kit's voice cracked. I know for a fact you deserve the world anyway. I really hope we're talking about the same thing right now, Thomas said, a breath away. Kit could feel every word on his own lips. Me too. He told him. Thank you. Yay. Oh, oh, wonderful. Very sweet. Wow. Um, That's amazing. Um, we have time. Um, those were amazing stories, amazing performances. If anyone has questions or comments for uh, anyone, um, maybe put it in the chat. We have so many screens, it would be hard to see if you raised hands and certainly hard if you shouted out. Uh, so if anyone would like to say something, um, put it in the chat and we can call on you. Yeah, Patrick's excellent job, writers and performers, absolutely. absolutely. Janae, awesome job. <laughs> yeah, and on the stories themselves, uh, I hope the authors saw all the wonderful comments uh, so, um, a question for the authors. How did it feel uh, to hear your work read this way, performed this way by these amazing actors? Uh, anyone want to take that one on? Any of our five authors? How did it feel for you? Yeah, go for it, Adora. Uh, it was kind of surreal. Um, I also enjoy acting. Um, and to have written something and have it acted by other actors was actually a really cool experience for me. Um, but it, it was just kind of like the moment of like, whoa, like that's my story and that's how how it's being performed. So yeah, it, it was like really cool, really exciting. <laughs> so glad. Zoe. Um, it made me feel almost like slightly vulnerable sharing my work, but um, I think in the end it was uh, a really nice experience. Absolutely, it is vulnerable. And uh, yeah, I love that comment, uh, uh, Adora. That's my story being performed. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> it's a good feeling, a really good feeling. And we don't get to see actors perform our work very often. So it's very special. Yeah. So a uh, note from, uh, you want to speak up, Jay, that, uh, <laughs> for yourself? So I don't have to read that. Sure. Yeah, I was just um, <laughs> in classes. We have students usually read their work aloud if they feel comfortable to do so. So it's really cool to see kind of the interpretation, this reading of this work. Uh, it gets this new life. Uh, it's sort of like um, I can liken it to uh, they had the first actor who played who hosted Blue's Clues and then they brought like the new actor in later on. Right. This idea that you get this new, fresh energy in the same world. Um, so I loved, I loved hearing like a, a new interpretation of the author's work. Absolutely. And uh, Jay is one of the wonderful folks at 916 Inc. that works with our young authors. Um, so a similar question for the actors. Uh, how did it feel to be performing a story with the author right there uh, hearing you, watching you? How did that feel? Uh, Caroline. Um, initially, I was a little bit nervous because, like, this writing is so, it's so fantastic, and I was just 
scared I wouldn't do it justice, but um, in like the dress rehearsals, um, getting the feedback from them and kind of working together as a team, I think that um, was really helpful in terms of the performance and it just made me feel a lot more comfortable and um, I could see their reactions as I was doing it, which was just so awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> right? Seeing the faces, it's, it's very cool. I know I was watching the expressions of the authors um, while the two of you were reading and that was really something. Did you want to add anything, Truman? Yeah, well, um, like Carolina was saying, it was scary just um, to, um, just to worry, were you actually doing the story justice? Because the, um, I uh, remember reading all these stories for the first time. It was, I didn't know what to expect with any of them, but they were all such, um, such great stories. And I, um, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to make sure that I could actually deliver them in, um, in a way that uh, they deserve to be delivered. And you did, absolutely did. Yeah, question for um, Ash. Um, you mentioned when you were introducing yourself that the um, it, your story was in a sense a group story with your family. H tell us a little more about that. How did that happen? My mom had gotten a bunch of prompts and we were testing them out. And um, my sister and my mom were all um, writing the prompt, the story together to go. With oh, so did, they wrote a different version of the same story. No, we all worked together on that story. <laughs> so it truly was a group story. Very cool. That is very cool. Yeah, group stories are fun. Uh, and then uh, another question um, for the authors um, from Shelley. Watching the performance, did it change what you thought your story was about or what emotion your story conveyed? Did you, did you look at it a little differently after hearing someone else perform your words? Any of you can take that on. <laughs> I know for me, I do. Uh, looked like, were you about to speak, Adora? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, it definitely, uh, originally when I wrote Unknown, it was meant to just be a short story, but seeing it performed really, really inspired me to continue it on, which I think is very interesting. Because uh, originally when working on the story, uh, it we, we had been talked about like, oh, continuing the story uh, and showing more. Um, but at the time I just felt that it wasn't, that's not where it needed to go. But after seeing today's performance, it really, really inspired me to continue the story on. So okay. that was funny. That's yeah. super cool. It got you interested in what, what's the next scene going to be? Yeah. That's wonderful. And, um, oh yeah, another question for the actors. So this is a good one. And I think interesting for a lot of us working with Zoom instead of being able to be you know, live in person. Um, how did it feel to be performing in front of uh, your computer screen and camera instead of a stage, which I assume is what you're used to is a, a wonderful stage and looking out and seeing people and here you look out and you see a bunch of little squares. How, how was that? Caroline? Um, it's definitely different. Um, I think that when you get up on a stage, there's a certain feeling that's kind of irreplaceable. And um, but in doing it on Zoom, I realized that that's not the only thing that I love about acting, um, which is great. And then I think that like in some ways, Zoom is a little bit restricting. Like you feel a little bit confined just because you can't move around, um, and it's a little bit hard to have like see the audience's connection and feedback but I think it's also a little bit freeing because um I can I think my emotions are a little bit more um real when I'm not having to do it for everyone and I'm just here in my room um but it was also great to see the screens and see everyone laughing or expecting stuff so excellent yeah Truman any thoughts on that one um, yeah, well, I think, um, especially with like comedies, there's always like, um, um, that moment where you get to like, see something that you, you worked, um, you worked on and something that you had already seen like hundred times be, be seen for the first time and actually get to see, um, the reaction. So even if I didn't get to like, um, get like the, the reaction that everyone gets, it was, it was still really nice to like, see a bunch of, 
um, of people and um, and know that like my like what I was working on would just and be able to see their reaction to um, the story that they were hearing for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, lost my train of thought. <laughs> Dorothy, can I jump in there for a absolutely, break? please? It, I, it, um... Truman and Caroline are reminding me of when we we normally don't have young actors and young authors and I the first time we pivoted to doing this online we had kind of a big name noir crime big deal literary author Todd Goldberg and his uh, short story was performed by David O. Doggone, I forgot his last name. I'm champion. Is that right? Campfield. 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 Sorry about that. So what I wanted to say about that was that Todd Goldberg had been writing forever and he directs a um a uh, master of fine arts program. He teaches professional writers. And when he saw David perform his short story, he started to cry and he said, I didn't realize that David's voice was my muse. He said, now when I write, I'm going to hear David's voice and see his face in my head while I write. And so it's this remarkable thing you can do when you get to know authors, when you get to know actors, and you can hear their voice while you're writing it. So just a, a magical interaction. So I urge you to interact with each other. That's okay. <laughs> well said, well said, yeah. <laughs> and I know getting to know each other a little bit last night probably helped uh, seeing, putting a face with the story and a face with the, the, the voice of the actor was really nice. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is that while yeah, miss the live theater, we get to see your every expression um, and you know uh, change in the in the face. Whereas often it can be frustrating, especially with a big show, not to really be able to see. You see the the gross movements um, and you can maybe tell a frown from a smile, but the nuances on your faces are captured here uh, on the screen. And there are some. I, I hope all of you are capturing, especially the actors and authors, all the wonderful comments um, from the audience in the chat. Uh, lots of people um, encouraging Adora to keep going because they want to know what happens next. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we had another interesting question from Emma too for um, Zoe about yeah. telling us where the word Miron comes from. I'm also very curious about this. Can you tell us where that comes from? Sure. So it's actually really interesting because if you look it up, it's not actually a word. It's, I don't think it's in the dictionary, but it actually comes from, so I take piano lessons and there's this piano song called the Muron. And I was convinced that it was a word. When I first heard it, I was like, oh, the Muron, like I can easily see that. It sounds like a word to me at least. Um, and then, so then I was like, hmm, wonder what it is. And then I was, so then I looked it up. I couldn't find anything. And I was like, oh, well, um, maybe I should decide what it is. So then I wrote the story. Very cool. That's great. <laughs> You're just like, I'm gonna use my brain to figure it out. <laughs> no, gave it a meaning, that's amazing. Uh, Cynthia's, Cynthia uh, Speakman has a question. Would it have made the experience less appealing if you were the only one on the screen? Like maybe say more about that, Cynthia. obviously and when you don't have all these little boxes looking at you mm -hmm. and you are the only one performing does have you done that before where you're the only one performing on the screen or is there are two of you on the screen <laughs> and how does it and how does it how does it change the way you respond to the work um because you're not seeing all these little faces react to you Caroline, were you going to answer? I saw your little hand. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think there's kind of pros and cons to both. Um, but one of the like main reasons that I love acting is just because of the human connection. Like, I feel like I'm communicating with people, even though I'm not really being myself. Um, but 
um, when there's no one, sometimes it's a little bit easier to kind of just fall into my own world um, and fall into the piece or whatever I'm performing. Um, but I think that Zoom is a good balance of that just because I'm in my room and I feel comfortable so I can kind of experience what I'm doing. Um, but I also have, I can see all your smiling faces. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And uh, Martha uh, Kite has a wonderful note for David Camfield. Um, brilliant compliment and he is incredible. So hopefully someone gets the word to him that uh, his, his ears should be burning right now that uh, I'll tell him. <laughs> Yeah, please tell him. <laughs> uh, is there a place to sign up for writing for stories on stage? Yeah, go to our website. Um, any, any of you who would like to submit a story, um, stories on stage, sacramento.org. Um, and uh, there's uh, information on there about how to do it. Anyone can also email us at any, any time, stories on stage 916 at gmail.com. Uh, yeah, we certainly, you know, we, we talked a little bit about community at the outset. And, and one of the things that's been really important uh, during the pandemic uh, is reaching out to local authors. And um, just to give a quick plug, we will have an anthology coming out soon that we solicited submissions for uh, over the last few months. And we've got like 44 amazing stories from local writers and some of our prior guests. So some of the wonderful professional authors that have graced our stage gave us their work, which is amazing. So um, we have some wonderful authors, both local and you know world renowned. So that'll be coming out soon. Oh, and thank you. Shelly posted the link uh, to our website there. Uh, Cynthia says, great job, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Greg, also for posting that. Um, is there, I guess, um, maybe turn it over to um, Emma, is there anything you wanted to add from a 916 perspective? Yeah, well, first off, I just want to continue to thank, um, first off, all the writers for contributing their work tonight, um, because it is a vulnerable experience. And I think we can all say that we're grateful that you shared that with us. Um, and to our performers, because you added so much emotion and in, in your own voice to all that work. So that was, that was really fun to see. Um, I do want to point out all of the stories performed tonight came from workshops led by 916 Inc. For those who don't know, 916 Inc. is a creative writing nonprofit here in Sacramento. And we host uh, writing workshops for youth in grades 3 through 12. Um, and we focus mostly on building self-confidence and um, self-expression and empathy. So if you'd like to read all of the stories tonight and many more, we have um, all of our fall digital anthologies available online to download and read for free. Um, you can find those on our website, uh, 916inc.org. Um, we're almost to our 200th anthology, so there, there's plenty more where that came from. <laughs> um, and I'd also like to let everyone know that we have a one day workshop series coming up in March. And we still have a couple slots left for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, first in a spoken word workshop, which will be co-led with uh, Sacramento Poet Laureate, Andrew Defy. Um, and we have a single spot left in a playwriting workshop, which will be co-led with B Street Theater, who is of course here tonight. <laughs> um, and lastly, given that most of us here tonight are not in that third through 12th grade range, we also host um, adult write nights on the third Wednesday of every month. So if you're curious about how our workshops go, um, we again, we do that every month and it's a really positive experience. It's a lot of fun. Um, and we have people from all over now since it's over Zoom. So all of that and more um, can be found at 916inc.org. I'll put it in the chat too. Um, yeah, and again, just thank you so much for our authors, for our writers, and for everyone who came out and supported them tonight. Yeah, thank you, Emma, for bringing this idea to Shelly and I uh, a few months ago, uh, or it wouldn't have happened. So appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, anything from B Street? Uh, I just want to just say again how happy I am to have been a part of this, even though I'm just sitting here watching these guys. It was so cool to see them. Uh, real quick, uh, she did. She told me not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Taylor Fleer is here tonight, and she's actually the uh, she she runs the teen acting 
class at B Street, and so she was really psyched to see him and sends her love to both Truman and Carol. You guys did amazing. I'm super proud. That was awesome. <laughs> that, that was Taylor. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, we've been doing work. We, we do a lot of workshops in schools. We do playwriting. So um, I've always wanted to do something with 916 Inc. because I know you guys do some extraordinary work with kids. And just listening uh, to the voices of these young students, was it was so refreshing. I'm, I've said it a couple of times during this whole experience that there have been as hard as it's been for the past year, so many obstacles, so much... Uh, sadness in the in the world with things that have gone on i am just constantly amazed and surprised by the extraordinary uh resilience and creativity that we've all found as a community of artists of all ages all races all all predispositions it's been just a remarkable experience and i'm so happy to be to just to be a part of this um we do have classes at b street we do them and when i say at it's all relative right <laughs> So right now we have we're doing our spring class, excuse me, our winter classes. We have spring classes coming up. We'll be doing a summer program, and I'm going to throw our link in the chat. We we have a very robust um, virtual program. We do things every night. Uh, we have a concert series on Fridays. It's at seven o'clock. It's an hour with artists from all over the country, and and I've seen some extraordinary work there. Uh, but you can check that out right there on our website. It's got uh, bstreettheater.org. You'll see everything that we're doing virtually. Um, it's, it's been a it's been a remarkable year in more ways than one, and I'm so happy to to be a part of this. And again, congrats to the readers and everybody. Just brilliant work tonight. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of it. It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And uh, if it's not um, inappropriate to say, we are all nonprofit organizations uh, bringing this kind of content to you. Uh, at least for stories on stage, 100% volunteer effort. Uh, uncompensated. Um, so any donations don't go to us, they go to pay our professional actors and authors and allow us to continue to bring stories. And I know 916 Inc. Uh, can use your funding as well as B Street Theater. These are all wonderful organizations, information on how to support uh, all of us on our websites. So